So they wrote this treaty and in about, I can't remember exactly, May or June, we were all connected. Remember this is 1995. We're all connected by fax machine and a few people were connected by email, but most groups were still communicating by fax. And we got the word that the United States was boycotting everything, had boycotted the whole thing all the way along. But the meeting was going on in Norway to finalize the text that would be brought forward in December. So this was a critical meeting. And we got the word that the United States was flying in and they wanted to stop the whole thing and have the treaty rewritten the way that they wanted it. So we were all in touch by fax with all of these wonderful bureaucrats from the Canadian government, in my case, and other countries as well with these sympathetic guys, mostly men, no, not mostly men, about 50-50 I think they were, anyway, sending us back faxes telling us what was happening and saying um, now they want us to uh, change the treaty so that it would say landmines are not legal under international law except in time of war. <laughs> and then they said, um, okay, 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 we'll have a treaty, but it will, there'll be an exception for the landmines that are on the, the um, border between North and South Korea. Those ones have to stay. So people were making these big posters saying um, no exceptions, I can't remember how it goes, no, no ifs, ands, and buts, anyway. And we were faxing, like my fax machine was just going day and night to get messages to the Canadian government sort of saying we know what you're doing and we insist that you hold firm. Canada said we need 48 hours for the United States to make its case and in that 48 hours they didn't succeed and the treaty went ahead and it's a very good treaty. It's, it, its only flaw is that it didn't exclude cluster bombs, didn't forbid cluster bombs and that was a conscious decision on, a part, on the part of the campaign. We didn't think we'd ever get it if we went and demanded that cluster bombs also be banned. But anyway, other than that, it's a great treaty. 1997, so four years from start to finish for civil society to pull that one off. Civil society took nuclear weapons to court. In this story, um, there was a group of people in New Zealand who got together with a, a, one of, a group of lawyers and a magistrate and they said, if dum-dum bullets are against international law, banned by the Geneva Convention, surely nuclear weapons are illegal. And the lawyer said, well, it's all fine for us to say that they must be illegal, but unless the International Court of Justice gives an, a written opinion that indeed they are illegal, it doesn't matter, it doesn't make any difference. And so this little tiny group of people said, well then let's have a worldwide campaign to get the, the International Court of Justice to give us that opinion. But we can't approach the court because we're individuals. A nation state can or a, um, an agency of the United Nations or the United Nations General Assembly can. So then the project was to get those and the World Health Organization could. The project became targeted for all of those who had the capacity to get the ICJ to give the opinion. And I'll cut to the chase and tell you that um, we succeeded beyond our wildest dreams. The boxes behind these people, that's the ICJ in, in, um, in um, The Hague, in the back of the picture, and the boxes contain millions, three million signatures of people who wrote declarations of conscience to indicate what the public conscience was saying, and those weighed very strongly on the judges. The judges' opinion said that indeed nuclear weapons are not legal under international law, and that the nuclear weapon states have a solemn treaty obligation to proceed immediately to nuclear disarmament. And it was the first time there had ever been an interpretation of the preamble to the treaty, the non-proliferation treaty, uh, and the, the um, nuclear weapon states had, already, had always said, oh, it's a preamble, it doesn't mean anything, there's no obligation. And the court said, this is a treaty obligation. And we have been able to use that now in courts of law, particularly where activists have taken uh, civil disobedience actions, such as breaking into the Faslane nuclear facility and so on. 
and they have been acquitted by the British courts because they have said they did the action because none of the legal means that they had used had been effective and having a Trident submarine in the, in the Faslane was uh, against international law and the court found that they were indeed right. And international law trumps national law. So that one took from, oh, the late 80s. I think 1988 was when we first began working on it and it took us until 1996 to get that declaration. <clears throat> International Criminal Court began as a civil society initiative and Bill Pace, one of the central figures in getting it founded, said that he thought it would be about the year 2099 that it would actually happen and, inst to, and instead it was in 1999. So it, it's an amazing thing that has been um, produced there. Medellin, La Medellin is another city in, in Colombia. Um, it had this murder rate of 184 per 100,000, which was one of the highest in the world. And they decided that they were going to do everything possible to change the kind of social contract between the state and the people. And the thing that they found most effective was setting up libraries in beautiful parks. And as soon as they started doing that, they found people um, assembled in these libraries that children t read out loud to children who were younger than they were, and children, young students, read to older people who were illiterate. They put in free internet access, and these places have become hubs of community. They proceeded to put in more and more projects that brought people together instead of increasing the police force. So changing the world. I guess we bring about change at three different levels. At the level of our personal lives and our own commitment to um, whatever you want to call your personal journey. We do it at the level of our neighborhood, our local community, the places where we're well known. And we do it by participating in global change and being sure that the values that we have in our own local communities are being carried forward at the international level. This is my editorial comment. We must regain our spiritual connections with the earth and with each other. And I love this quotation from Morris Sendak. Remember him from Where the Wild Things Are, when, which you read when you were a little kid? There must be more to life than having everything. I just love that. When I was in the Soviet Union in 1986, I was given this absolutely amazing interpreter named Sasha Agapiev. He was a huge fat man. He was about 300 pounds and about five feet tall and chain smoker traveling with ten doctors. You can imagine how that worked. Anyway, <laughs> Sasha was terribly, terribly funny and when we arrived in Moscow and we just finally got settled in our hotel rooms, he wrote his telephone number down for me and he handed it to me and he said, Mary, if there is anything at all that you need, here is my telephone number, just call me, and I will tell you how to live without it. <laughs> and I think, I think we need a 1-800 number, you know, to call up and say, but I just have to have a convection oven, and they'll tell you how to live without it, right? That's what we need.